Hey, everybody, this is Jeff Blue, multi platinum AR exec for artists such as Lincoln Park, Macy Gray, Corn, Limp Biscuit, and many, many others. I am now on the Anthony Rogers show. We're discussing music, songs, everything you could possibly want to know about music and film, all on the Anthony Rogers show. And we're going to rock a couple beers. Republican Anthony Rogers has no previous political experience. Rogers, a comedian, is well known for a podcast called The Anthony Rogers Show. Hey man, this is Tommy Chong, and right now you're listening to The Anthony Rogers Show. Hey all you cool cats and kittens, it's Carol Baskin, and you are listening to The Anthony Rogers Show. Hey y'all, this is Kevin from Candlebox, you are listening to the funny man Anthony Rogers. Hey, my name is Alex Sulkin, writer of TED and Family Guy, and you're listening to The Anthony Rogers Show. Lucky you. If you think for a fraction of a second that you could look this good, this majestic, without Cervantes Beard Oil Company, well, you're just wrong. So go to the link in the description and become a man. Get some Cervantes Beard Oil right now. Welcome back to the greatest show in the entire universe. Um, today we have an absolute legend in the music industry, uh, award-winning songwriter, BMI, a uh, five-time Grammy award-winning artist. Uh, yeah, worked with Linkin Park, Macy Gray, Korn, Aaliyah, Hoobastank, Lump Biscuit. Uh, he is too big for this show and probably should have said no, but I, I appreciate him taking the time and going backwards to talk to us a little bit. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm doing great. I mean, I once I saw the beard, I was like, I'm a new beard guy, so I figured, what the hell, I got to do it. <laughs> I, need, I need more information. You can ask me about music and you can tell me how to keep the beard okay. <laughs> we'll trade, yeah, we'll trade skill sets. Like, <laughs> well, well, first, all you have a beard is you do absolutely nothing. <laughs> okay. Oh, mine itches. Mine itches like crazy. I don't know how to get over it. I put oils in it and, you know, it's uh, but I think you have a good company that you work with, right? Which one? What do you go, mine? I uh, don't know. I saw something. Was that your company, the beard company? Oh, no, that's a spawn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, no, I, you like how I worked the plug-in for you? No, that's great. They, they're gonna love Done. that. No, they're gonna they're gonna absolutely love that. <laughs> that's awesome. It's uh okay. I don't even know where to start because you have so many just awesome accomplishments and like this is like a, no, I mean this you. is great. I mean you were, you have like eight of my childhood dream bands. I think that you worked with. Like I I, I think like oh. I, I was a huge Limp Biscuit fan. Like I was like one of the biggest Limp Biscuit fans in like Corn. All that was like 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 no one had a better 1999 than those guys. You know. Oh yeah, I, I lived it. It was it, I was living the you know my own dream. I used to like wake up going, how do I get paid to do this? Um, and it, you know it just it happens. You know all these artists, nobody really wanted to sign. They weren't big artists. And uh, you know I've been blessed in my life just to have a really good ear and an ability to interact with artists and and see their vision and help their vision come to be. So great job, you know. So did you but discover you. a lot of these bands? I know you're telling me uh, like before we recording that you just you found uh, Lincoln Park basically. Like, did you discover a lot of these bands? Like these being an AR rep also for Atlantic? Uh, specifically Lincoln Park and, and I don't know if your listeners also know Macy Gray, but her specifically amongst She's several great. others. But um, the big discovery stories I had where uh, nobody wanted to touch these bands, and I was in on like the very first show, um, specifically Lincoln Park, and uh, you know that's what we were discussing prior to. Uh, you know, getting on here uh, was the actual role of A&R has died off monumentally year by year by year. And I always took it to um, be a facilitator of greatness and, and visionaries, musical visionaries who just needed that extra person in their life to believe in them and help facilitate their vi vision to uh, be heard by the world. So um, to me, that's what A&R is and being able to contribute, um, you know, creatively and then on, on the business side too, uh, to help somebody, you know, foresee their vision out to the world. So what is, uh, say somebody's watching this and like, they, they have a band, like what, what would they do to uh, either get your attention and then what would you do to, let's start with that. Like, what would a band do to get your attention? Like an A&R executive that has like Grammys and like, I mean, like, like a lot of awards and like, well, my like, bands have Grammys. So yeah, the bands do. But well, yeah. fair. Yeah. yeah. Great. You, you yeah. found bands that, that, that yes. have Grammys and like, uh, you've won BMI awards. I mean, you're like yeah, what they'd call a legend right. basically. I mean, this is legendary stuff. I mean, everyone's goal, I think what is to be a rock star or something, you know, they call it influencer now, I guess, but like everyone's mm -hmm. goals like to do this. I mean, what, what would you tell a band? How, well, first off, how would a band get your attention? Like a musician that's like really good, did the work on that and, but can't market themselves, I guess. Um, usually it's somebody, um, I see my dog in the background. Um, <laughs> usually it's somebody, I put his dog bed under the air hockey table and now he's trying to get that out. But, um, <laughs> anyways, uh, any, any, any type of place, uh, everything in life you do is fortuitous. You know, 
I just believe in getting out there, doing your craft, and somebody will discover you. Uh, and we were talking uh, briefly about Lincoln Park, and I was just lecturing at UCLA, and I was looking at an intern for another artist uh, that I had just signed named Macy Gray. And I don't know if your listeners know her, but she also won a, a Grammy. She's great. And um, so I was lecturing at UCLA, and uh, which will segue into a whole another topic because I am starting to do this again at universities around the world. Um, but I was lecturing about, you know, a and what I did because I was an alumni at UCLA. And uh, this kid wanted to intern for me, came in to my office the next morning, pretty much unannounced. And by the way, this is all in this book that I happen to have here called <laughs> One Step Closer. And it is the true origin story of Lincoln Park and how it became to be. Um, so uh, I had uh, the opportunity to meet this kid who looked at my wall and saw that I had signed Limp Bizkit and Corn. And I had a Matchbox 20 uh, plaque up there too. And he's just like, I'm gonna have a band that's bigger than every one of those. And I'm like, whoa, the, ba the, the ball's on this kid, you know? And um, his name was Brad Delson. And he goes, I play guitar. And I go, well, yeah, someday I'll hear your band, right? And I just loved the kid. I hired him as my intern. And uh, I went to see their first show. And I was just, uh, I was really inspired by their belief in themselves and their, their vision. And there was something about the sound that I really loved, but I knew could be cultivated and curated. And because it was their very first show they ever played. So, um Long story short, after three and a half years of, uh, you know, massaging it, uh, finding a new singer, getting rid of the original singer and uh, focusing their vision and helping them get it, you know, get to be where they were. I was able to actually sign them to Warner Brothers as I, my career progressed. Their career went along with me and I made them part of my uh, uh, my employment deal uh, to go to Warner Brothers and sign them an executive produce. And, you know, I had obviously done the publishing deal with them. Uh, it just, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in artistry and I don't give up. A lot of people uh, do, um, you know, give up along the way if something doesn't happen right away. And that's that's people that are helping you as well as the artists themselves kind of give up. And um, it takes tenacity, drive, dedication uh, and belief in yourself and, and authenticity because you need to stick with your vision. You should listen to other people along the way, but you really need to stick with your vision. And if you're talented, stuff will happen. So People reach out to me all the time. Um, I, I see a lot of bands when I go out and lecture at different universities and I do these showcases, which again, we can discuss uh, towards the end because I am looking for people. People can interact with the podcast and reach out to me. Uh, my Instagram, by the way, is Jeff Blue Music. That's J-E-F-F -F Blue, B-L-U-E Music on Insta, Twitter, Facebook, all of that. And my uh, website is jeffbluemusic.com. So um I look for areas in particular where I can go out and discover new artists. And um, in doing so, I can find, if, if I don't love the band, I have, God, I've discovered probably about 30, 40 different artists that have been in massive bands like GNR to um, Paramore. Um, my buddy is now in Grandson, this amazing new band. Um, one guy was in the, in the Who that I was with in the, the original uh, band that I was in. Anyways, discovering artists that are in current bands and being able to go, hey, you're extremely talented. Um, and pull those elements out because that's what great artistry is. A, a, an artist or a band or a group is uh, the sum of all the parts. You know, if there's one weak link, uh, it's not going to have that chemistry that's going to really excel through everything. So part of it is me discovering units and the subset that can become that ultimate um, amazing artist. And uh, I was able to do that with Lincoln Park and the discovery of Chester Bennington because he was the missing piece of that band. It's crazy to think about, and like you, you gave me chills in the beginning of that Lincoln Park story. Like that, like I like felt how real that was, like how magic that was. It's like, uh, and then that's kind of crazy, man. Like I think, uh, I mean, I think that's what's the music industry is kind of missing right now. Is like, like A and R reps that care like you do, kind of like I think, like uh, you saw that a lot in like the, I guess like sixties to nineties or whatever. But like, uh, there's like, these heroic guys that found all these good bands and stuff. But yeah, no, like I think like it, it dwindled a little bit in like the like early two thousands. Then like I guess like people going platinum. These uh these like mumble rappers going platinum again in like twenty sixteen. Kind of like started that up again. Where like they're like labels were signing these guys that are going platinum that weren't like Jay Z or Drake or even these the same five people. You know, right? And everything sounds faceless. And that and and I was just had this conversation because I actually have a docu series on the history of A and R. Um, so I'm working right doing that right now. And so I was in the uh, having conversations with this company. I was just interviewed with in, in London and they were saying the same thing. Why, why are there no rock stars? And that's because um, everything, when everything sounds faceless, uh, you know, that there are the rock stars that emanate out of every genre, um, whether it was, you know, 
the sixties vibe or disco or, you know, hair metal or grunge. There are all those, those uh, visionaries that start that trend. And then when things get oversaturated, just like anything, um, you know, it, it peters out and becomes faceless and it becomes like, Oh, that, that era. And, um, there that is going to happen again and there's there are some artists out there that are incredible and that i'm seeing on burgeoning that are, are really going to make that difference and uh you know um what one artist i brought in super and i'm always super early so that's why i say people reach out um machine gun kelly i brought to atlantic records in 2009 oh wow that's and uh, they had they passed on him yeah and huh. uh, it was you know but it was early and i i discovered him at a showcase um uh, that we were doing just like this and that I'm talking about now in Cleveland. And I was just blown away by the kid. And, um, you know, you know, same with the killers really, really early. Um, but I have all these amazing stories that, you know, just, I, I've had a, a very, um, engaging life. I've been very blessed to, you know, really do what I do, but it also is the passion on my end right now. and r really is focused on social metrics, what's happening. There's not a lot of development. So, Artists in general are left to fend for themselves and build, you know, as uh, Mark Geiger used to say, um, the fifth member of the band is the social media person. And that's unfortunate because it does take away from the creativity of it. And you're focused on portraying something that, you know, you're trying to give to the public, but they're kind of taking the, the role of the record label. But in doing so, you don't have that time that you would spend on songwriting, on being creative, um, creating the essence of the band, you're like, hey, this is our social media, this is what we're doing. And it's a time, it's a time constraint. It's a necessary thing right now, but that is where a and has, has gone to and looking at Spotify playlists and how many likes you have and how many plays and, you know, um, but they used to look at, you know, like Linkin Park had never played a show in their life. You know, uh, they played one, I signed them and then we did a lot of showcases. They maybe, we did a couple shows at, you know, colleges, et cetera. Um, but really we were focused on getting a record deal. Well, um, that was kind of unheard of because record labels would want to see artists, you know, how much they're touring, they're getting radio play, et cetera, et cetera. And it's kind of similar now record labels want to see, you know, what your socials are. Are you getting play on Spotify? What, you know, what, uh, streaming, you know, your streaming stats are, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's similar, but, uh, the ability to do stuff like I would do, even with was Macy or the last good night, whatever, get in early and just work on songwriting and creating a sound that will uh, relate to people. That's very difficult to do. And that really doesn't happen in A&R and, and hasn't happened in a long, long, long time. Yeah. I see like two, uh, like two kind of angles with like, uh, as I, I'm a consumer, I'm not involved in like uh, music at all, but, but uh, for, as a consumer standpoint, I kind of see like, uh, like these guys that basically don't need record labels get signed. <laughs> like, like, they got, like mm-hmm. they're already selling records. Like, I mean, you had like a, like that, that 2016 boom of mumble rappers. You had like a, you had like little Zan, little pump. Like, like you had all these guys that were already established and selling records. And then you had like labels like Warner, like, Oh, I'll give you $4 million. For these, I mean, right. I, thought, I thought they were fools for signing a record label because they were already established. But then you have like this other angle too, that if you get like a million, like I, a couple of the artists I know, like that I've had on the show and stuff, if you get like a million likes or a million followers on TikTok, like you guys have you guys have like labels like banging down their door and, and like so it's like a weird it's a weird kind of thing to me like the social media thing you're saying is like mm. because like you never know what's going to hit somebody i mean you, it's like you never know like this this like violin i've seen violin players on the sidewalk that are better than the radio you know it's like it, it's just a, it yeah. just it just depends on like what exactly well that's why you like, haven't seen a lot of rock stars anymore because it's not organic for the most part you know it's it's what True. again social media is what we put out there you know you, you can but that's i mean that's that's the arts too you can have a complete recluse nerdy person and then they just blow up on stage because but that is who they are that's uh, that's the emotion and the emoting of their inner character you know um but yeah i mean end of the day i'm i'm excited to see who comes out as new rock stars because all the new rock stars have been hip-hop driven and rappers for the most part in that genre and i think there's a a big push rock is coming back um we were talking earlier uh there's this kid grandson and my best friend is the drummer in that band. And I actually discovered him through a showcase I did in Los Angeles. He was from Spain. And when I heard um, the grandson material, I was just like, this is like trap rage against machine. The kid had a purpose, you know, this kid, Jordan, just, he had his identity. He sounded intelligent. He was speaking intelligently. He had a purpose. And I think the, the day of the rock star is going to come back. So, um, 
you know, and, and it, that really wasn't a &R. That that band that didn't they didn't have a &R. That band went out and did it on their own, toured on their own. Um, that's what artists are forced to do these days. Um, but in a case like a Lincoln Park or something like that, um, if you're fortunate enough to find somebody that knows how to develop you uh, and your, your artistry, then you know it's a benefit. And that's that's still what my passion is: is discovering new artists who may not have the means or the backing to go on tour um, like a grandson did and, and, you know, have, you know, make it in a van and, and go out there and just kick it. Um, so. No, it's awesome. I see your passion. I see like your heart, your kind of work ethic. You seem like you have a strong work ethic too. And like, I think that's, I mean, I think when people want something to happen, they're getting where they fit in, you know, there's going to be multiple ways to get to the top or whatever their yeah. goals or dreams are. I think that's cool, man. And I definitely think rock's coming back. I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm 35. So like rock, music was like dead for like 10 years. Like when I was like in my twenties, like, like there was like this like 10 year spot to where like, I mean, you, you had to be, from my perspective, you had to be established before 1998 to really, to really, to, to really do anything like, like in music in the early two thousands. You had like, you still had like Foo Fighters and like U2 and like these bands that just been for, I mean, I'm not going to make fun of them right now, but I'm just saying like, I just don't, that's not, it didn't hit a home with me in my twenties. You know what I mean, like, like, mm -hmm. like Dave Grohl was like a session drummer for Nirvana to me, you know, like that's how I viewed it. And, and I was just kind of like, uh, but then like all the smart people, I think went into other fields because music wasn't making money. And then now they're coming back, I think, because it's starting to, you guys figured it out. I think like you, uh, I think, I think, uh, all like, not necessarily you, but like the, your field has kind of figured it out. It seems like you've been consistent, but your field has kind of figured it out more. Like it was hard to monetize and it was hard to, it was easy to get famous, but it was hard to monetize the music. Like, like uh, you, get, right. you get 10 million views. You're like, oh man, I blew up playing this song on a subway. But then you're like, who am I selling records to? No one buys records. Who am I selling t-shirts to? I can't get to them. You know, it's, it was a weird, there's a weird time. Like, I, did that hit you at all? Or was that just like, uh, like, from oh, no, it was brutal. Well, also, <clears throat> it was a double whammy for me because uh, rock died. Yeah. So rock kind of took a, a double whammy for me. So rock, rock started dying out. Um, hip hop and pop, really EDM, the, everything started pushing rock out. And I blame that on rock, uh, honestly, because nobody was doing anything really innovative. It was all like, I look at rock and music, all types of music in terms of color, like a painting. And, you know, uh, it was very vibrant for a while and things were exciting. And then rock just became like brown, you know, it was like the, the muted color, you know, it was like nothing was <laughs> popping out. And then it just was like, um it just ate itself and that in my opinion is how all genres kind of end you know when it becomes faceless and everybody's doing the same thing and you can't really tell oh who is that it sounds exactly like so-and-so oh now that's this new band that sounds exactly like x y and z and that's what happened with rock in my opinion um and ironically that's what i was getting when i was shopping lincoln park as everybody said oh the whole new metal yeah and i'm like this isn't really new metal this is music this is rock music with pop overtones and hip-hop and uh people are just like no it sounds like every single thing else and all these other rock bands were getting signed other than lincoln well lincoln park came out and it's like oh hell like the audience spoke up and saw that we have an amazing melody guy in chester and a, a, an amazing singer who can you know go from the sweetest melodies to the most aggressive you know melodies and screams and uh, a cinematic lyricist rapper like a mike shinoda and it was like, okay, now people finally get it. But the record label actually didn't really see it either. And they were, I don't know, when you read this amazing book called One Step Closer, available <laughs> at Target, Wall, Wall, what is it? Walmart. Let's try that again. Target, Walmart, Amazon, anywhere books are sold, Barnes & Noble. Um, it'll tell you the story about how difficult it was for people to understand that this was a new sound and not just, um, you know, rehash of everything else that was in rock. But the... Uh, when rock kind of died, I think it because it kind of ate itself. Um, you had the advent of these, you know, hip hop rock stars and they became the new rock stars and you had DJs becoming rock stars. People always want a rock star to look up to, although yeah. these artists didn't really have the musicality in that. And that to me, I mean, I was, I was in Vegas seeing these massive, massive, you know, EDC shows. And I was like, I had tears in my eyes going, what the hell happened? You know, there's no, weird. there's somebody up there pushing buttons all due respect to them. And I do work with DJs, but there's nobody literally up there sweating their ass off, jumping across the stage, you know, drums, guitar, and a whole vibrancy that, you know, elated people, but it did work. Now I think that whole DJ scene, and I think it's been, uh, you know, imploding for a while. Uh, hip hop sounds very much like itself, although on the R and B side, and I don't know if your listeners know, I um, was fortunate enough to work with Macy Gray who was a, a, an iconic R&B star and uh, Aaliyah, I did her, you know, the Queen of the Dam soundtrack. Oh, wow. But um, 
the uh the r&b has some amazing amazing uh and i would i would turn rock stars in there like just because they are so incredible and their voices are incredible and they're performing with you know instruments and whatnot um and i think that is now finally coming back because the hip-hop scene has kind of gotten a little um too samey you know and a little um, faceless, and that is allowing rock to finally come back. But we went through pa- phases of pop, hip hop, rap, and now R and B, and then rock is finally you know everything cyclical in life. Yeah, with the EDM thing, I think it's the same thing as like disco. Like there's there's like a a culture of people that don't really care about their artistic integrity of music; they just want to dance. I I, I think that's like mm-hmm. disco, EDM, like stuff like that. I hope I hope rap like does this thing that rock did. Cause like r- rap's almost in that like I want to hold your hand phase that like rock was in. You know, it's like this like uh this, it's infancy, and I almost want to see it expand to like psychedelic and like other other aspects of like of rap. I, I'm kind of interested in its evolution because it's so big almost. I mean, it could just I mean it could fail and go away, but I but I, I almost like. Like, I really want to see it evolve, you know? I just want to see, like, rap kind of evolve and, like, and grow up, you know? And stop just, like, bragging about, like, like material things they don't even really have, you know? It's just, like, you know what I mean? They're just- well, somebody – and then there, there are artists that, that do do that and do Fair. it on purpose. And, I mean, you know, Fair. we can even go into country, and country was super exciting for a, a while. I mean, there was the new pop country. And then that, country. to me, sounds very samey. You know, they've been re- rehashing the same sound for – ages you know like once uh you know florida florida georgia line little big town all those that became very that pop country you know jason aldean all, all this stuff and then you know just became kind of faceless because everything started sounding the same the same production and then they, they intertwined you know some hip-hop in the country and that was fresh for a second but everything you know everything has its its moment its peak you know it's advent its peak and it's and it's valley and it has to um just like anything any artist has, has to reinvigorate and and you know grow and if, yeah. and if it doesn't then there'll be space for the next you know next genre I, i've been seeing like a lot of like uh this outlaw country thing kind of kind of happen too like like uh certain certain artists like young artists are doing this like outlaw country mm-hmm. kind of thing and, and like i personally i like country gospel a lot i'd like to see like a strong like like got a, a strong musician like kind of carry that because there, there's a huge market for country gospel that people don't even see i feel like Cause, cause i think most people try to do rock or they try to do rap or something like that like, ignoring the other genres that are i mean I mean, I think country makes a lot of money. I mean, personally, I think that that's. I, I actually do like country, believe it or not. To I love me, it. I love when it. When rock died, country took its a lot of those sounds. That but again, rock to me, all music is popular in, in its structure. When you say pop music, like to me, you know, I may get hate for this, but Linkin Park was a pop band. It had they're popular. Rock. I mean, that's all it means it, that they're popular. Yeah, wouldn't have pop structure. There were oh, hit fair. songs, there. and 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 then you have the production, which adds on, you know, the tonality you know, the heaviness, the, you know, the performance, but the songs in their essence were, you know, intro or, you know, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, huge bridge, boom, boom, dynamics. That's pretty much every song on, on the radio is for the most part. There's always the exceptions, True. but that is what, you know, it's a pop song, but then you have your categories, you know, and country kind of took that over, but hard rock is that too. If you break down a hard rock song, that's good. You can do it in an R&B, uh, you know, cover you can you can take a, a country twist to it you can take an acoustic twist to it that's a sign of a great song i agree and i'd really like make to... a pop song heavy you know yeah i mean yeah you could really do anything with the like with the formats and stuff like i just really want to see, like these these gospel these country gospel songs are are hitting like huge numbers on youtube like like long black train mm-hmm. by josh turner like a bunch of these like things like that if you had like a I don't know, like somebody like a, if you had like a rock star cover one of these songs, it would it would kill. It would it would absolutely kill. I think like uh, you, well, you see- I have I'm gonna do a shout out to this kid. You guys should go check him out, Josh Landry. Um, hit him up. Uh, sad songs only on on um, TikTok. Uh, but the kid's amazing, Josh J O S H. I think L-A-N-D-R-Y. I've heard of this guy. He's huge on TikTok, right? Yeah. Uh, so I I come. How do you spell his last name? L A N D R Y. And D-R-Y. I'm going to look him up real fast. I'm listening to you. This kid's voice inspires me. And it's just, you know, it reaches all the levels that uh, Chester Bennington had. He reminds me of like Chester Bennington meets uh, Rob Thomas. Um, and then mix any other great, great artists in there. Um, but those voices are hard to come by. You know, people don't have the versatility and the range to do that. And, um, you know, he did a cover of uh, Adele, you know, Chasing Pavements. And it just blew me away. And they could do the hardest, you know, rock song. And uh, that's really what sold me when I met Chester. Chester went in. We had Macy Gray um, come down to one of our um, rehearsals. And 
she brought an artist and then Chester jumped on and sing a duet with this artist <clears throat> and the band jumped in and played some like R&B. And I was just like, holy crap. Um, <laughs> I'm not giving up on this Chester kid. And I was, that's when I finally saw his R&B side and his ability to uh, dig into those melodies and, and that soul. And I was just blown away. So uh, versatility and the ability to jump into any style of music, in my opinion, is, is a sign of a great um the great artist and a musician in general and, and the knowledge of that, how to do that. You know, some people can only scream and that, you know, some people can only sing a certain way. The ability to uh, flow in and out of different sounds is super important to me. Yeah. It's, so it's funny. I'm always looking for a new artist, by the way. So <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll start practicing now. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah, you have to have a great beard though. You must have a great beard. <laughs> it's gotta be red too. But uh, no, uh, so no, it's it's funny to the scream thing too. Cause like I was I was reading like uh, studies on like um on like metal and like uh, like like a certain kind of metal that like they only scream and stuff and like horror films scream and stuff. It, yeah. And you usually that is um the people that are into that stuff are like are are like had a really traumatic life and the trauma of like mm -hmm. the music or the or the videos basically give them some kind of like sense of peace and it's like a controlled trauma structure. Mm -hmm. So psychologically speaking, that's what it does for the listener. Whereas it doesn't even sound good to them. Like like from my understanding, like, like it's not like like, like they may. Think think it does because the feelings it gives them but but it's right. basically it's basically just like uh it's it's almost healing them of their trauma which is weird or like or or diverting it at the very least which is like like what the horror genre and like metal does like psychologically speaking which is like really weird to me but interesting you well know? the way i always say good music makes you feel like you belong that you're part of it so all types of music all genres there are are popular in, in any sort of way that connects with an audience there's an audience for that because it allows them to feel that they're not alone. And that's what oh. good music does. You know? Um, that's, so that's a great point. That's a great point. Mm. I, I like your, uh, I like your optimism, man. I, I'm like that sometimes I just didn't get much sleep, you know? So I, like, I, I, I love the positivity and I think that's, that's part of your success. I'm, I'm too. forever. I wake up after two hours sleep and I'm, I'm amped and, and always going. So. Yeah. I don't. I don't have that as much. Like I, I don't have. But no, I. I try to try to stay as positive as you are. Honestly, like I. I really love the positivity and seeing like the the good and like everything. It is true. I mean, like if it if people like listening to it, it doesn't matter what I think. It, it really. It, to be honest, right. it really does, as long as it hits them and like like in, in a good way, I guess. Like, but I, I'm still stuck on that. I want to see. I want to see country gospel up. Like my my girlfriend's uh, or my wife now. Her grandfather um got me into this music and like I found like. I, I grew up on like rock and stuff and I, and I just got burnt out on it. That's all I've been listening to for like my entire life. And then I found like this new genre of like old country and like uh the Grand Ole Opry and like gospel and all that. And I'm like, and I, and I went into it like the same way I used to like rock and like, and then I see these numbers and I'm just like, I'm like, how is no one taking a country gospel artist right now? I, I feel like that would, if you had the right act, like, like it was almost like outlaw almost. And then country gospel mixed in there, that would kill right now. Well, let's find that artist, man. And then uh, I, interesting story when you when you talk about that i discovered macy gray because uh i was in a rock band and a long abbreviated story i was working i was a journalist so i was writing for billboard and you Hits seem like a journalist random. that makes sense you used it no, no, no you, that was yeah that's, no, you well, that's seem like it you get that vibe yeah that's how i taught myself um how to write so i could explain the different elements of music to artists and to record labels and that was my way of I used to be a lawyer, so I had a law. I couldn't get a job in law because I was in a rock band. I had hair down to here and the earrings and the whole thing. And uh, so I started the music magazine and made my way. And then long story short, this older guy that I worked at a lot, I, it was like kind of a law firm was for the government. And we'd go on the, uh, for our lunch and he goes, hey, you've got to hear this artist so we don't have to listen to your rock music. This woman named Nina Simone. And he, you know, he goes, this is the one time we're going to listen to a CD of his. And he put it in and I was just absolutely blown away. And it was this voice that was um, just absolutely perfectly imperfect. And that's the only way I could just, I was just like haunted by this woman's voice. And um, I, I immediately called up my friends and, you know, my bandmates. I'm like, you've got to listen to this everything about this is what we should be doing in a rock form formation, you know, and, and taking um, those tones and the, um, the passion and, it, you know, her voice would always crack. I love stuff like that. So everything, if you look at my history of artists, even from Daniel powder, who had that song, had a bad day. I, I love artists who push it to the vulnerability where their voice is going to crack. But I got that from Nina Simone move forward, like four years, 
I'm listening to this demo tape this woman brings in and it's this rock version of Janis Joplin and it's a woman named Macy Gray. And I heard her voice and she's like, you hate it, right? And I'm like, you know, I didn't tell her. I go, I freaking loved it because she was managing her and I wanted to sign it or she was her ex-manager. And uh, I just could not stop listening to this voice. I'm like, this is the new modern uh, Nina Simone, Billie Holiday. And it was oh, Macy yeah. Gray. And for your listeners who haven't heard it, that was my first breakout album. Um, uh, she had a song called I Try, which, you know, won a Grammy. And uh, yeah, that, um, it was, yeah. That's an epic song, an epic artist. My my uh, my buddy, Luke, I was telling him I was uh, having you on here. Uh, and he actually knew you from AC Gray. That's actually how he knew you. Mm. Uh, I was like, I just showed, I clicked, I just sent him a screenshot of your Instagram just for, just because you have all of your, your bio there and stuff. And he's like, oh, I knew, I knew Macy Gray. I didn't know the rest of that. He's like, uh, me and him were like big, like corn and lemon biscuit fans. Like when we were kids. So I, I was trying to, I was, I was just like, like telling him that's how my day was going. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I got to talk to this dude who like did a lot of magic and like the industry and stuff. And he's like, oh, I know, mm -hmm. I know him from that. I know it's like Macy Gray, like definitely Joplin too. I mean, all those artists, I mean, I mean, that's a great, those are great examples of like how she sounded and like she stood out too. I mean, that, that's, there's no one else oh, yeah. that sounds like her really. You can compare it to people in the past, but like there, there, there's no one that sounds like that. And that's what I love about, I love about Macy Gray, to be honest. Well, all those artists that I've been lucky to work with, artists sound like them after the fact, you know? Um, mm. And it's, it's really amazing to know that so many people, throughout the the decades have been influenced by some of the artists i've been able to work with so um you know uh and then i i also discuss it i want to plug the book too much but it is called okay the poster available at target and like we should have one like one of those little things you know walmart <laughs> um but i do talk about what i loved and i um found and was was engaged by by what qualities these artists had that stood out to me and um, I really try to hammer it home for people who are interested in, you know, the music business, whether on the business side or as an artist, what it really takes, not just about the dedication, but what I think A&R people look for and what uh, audiences really hear in their brains that sets stars apart from just another singer. Because you can also have a great voice and be amazing, but you may not be a star. And I get into all, I break down everything in a dialogue format like a story um but i in i involve all the essential concepts about what it takes to make it in the music business in any form in the book so it's entertaining so it's not just like a, hey you need to do this that and the other it's all in the book in a dialogue so it reads and you're like you can relate to it as part of the story nice now we only need to teach musicians how to read and then we're fine. <laughs> yeah I'm well you know what a lot, a lot Oh, to read. I thought you meant to read music. Yeah. That's oh, no, no, I just meant to read. I was, I was, yeah, was going to say a lot, a lot of the artists that I've worked with um, that are incredible, especially guitarists, don't know how to read music. That's why um, I tell people too. Like, like I tell a lot of people that too, like music theory, like, like they'll be like, oh, I don't know music theory. I'm like, you just have to be good. You just have to sound good. Because like the consumer has no idea what music theory is. And then that's who's buying, that's who's buying the music from my perspective. I mean, I'm I, like I said, I'm a consumer, but I, I, I always thought that. I always thought that when I was a kid too. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm like, no one knows how to read music. So like other than like five people, and like you know what I mean. So like it's not applicable as a sale. Well, a lot, a lot of people do. Like uh, of course, like Brad does and, and all that stuff. But like DJ Ashba, he always told me he didn't know what he was doing. At there's plenty of you know, but he's a freaking genius. Now, I mean, now he yeah. does. He knows everything. But you know, he taught himself. Um, but uh, I forgot what it was oh the irony is. Hello, I'd like to talk to you about one of our sponsors. We have Liquid Gummies. They are Delta Nine THC. These are strawberry flavored. I just ate one. I'm not going to eat another one. <laughs> They're kind of strong, but um, these are awesome. Get you some. Link in the description or Google Liquid Gummies or go to Leaf New York. I mean, they sell them there too. Um, get some of these if you're of age and whatever laws in your land, follow them. But these are legal THC ones. So, I mean, even if even in, these are federally legal, so you're not worried about the feds when you're getting messed up or whatever. I don't know what you're worried about, but Sometimes that's a concern. These are delicious. They're awesome. And I am proud to say they are a sponsor of the Anthony Rogers show. So I wrote some, you know, I wrote for Hoobastink. I wrote a, you know, best-selling uh, number one song in nine countries. I wrote that. Wow. Um, it was called uh, Pictures of You, which was a pop song. I, you know, you wrote, wrote that song? Macy's first album. Yeah, I, I, I was the main writer of Pictures. You know that song, Pictures of You? Yeah, I know you're Yeah, I, I know these bands that you work yeah. with pretty well. Yeah, so I, played, I played the drums, produced, AR, published, and uh, yeah, I co wrote that with this guy, Curtis Inneberry. That's awesome. Um, 
Yeah. Anyways, that was a fun project. But I actually was head of A&R for RCA at the time. And I knew how to play drums, guitar and piano, but I couldn't sit down and go, hey, this is, you know, blah, 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 this note, this and the other. But so I took a class at uh, Valley College, um, you know, uh, community college. And so I was going there at like seven o'clock in the morning and then making it out to Beverly Hills where I was head of A&R for RCA under Clive Davis. And uh, wow. I was, t- I took this piano class. The first song I wrote after getting out of that class was pictures of you. So it definitely helped me in melody and but I wrote melody and lyric for that song. Um, you know, and obviously I had this great guy, Curtis, who wrote it with me, uh, especially for piano. Um, and it just, it really helps communicate when you do know how to write music and what you're exactly playing. It, it takes a whole different form. And the other irony is I had to deal with universal music publishing and my music publisher, Tom Sturgis goes, don't get any more involved in uh, understanding music theory because it'll, what you, the way you write is iconic to you only. And you don't want to change that because you write really good melodies and you may be, you may think, take yourself out of your creative brain and try and make it fit into a format that is supposed to fit and it won't have your style to it. Totally agree. I think authenticity is yeah. the best part of art at all. Like, it, it, mm-hmm. no matter what you are, musician, comedian, filmmaker, what, I mean, whatever. I think authenticity is the, is the best. I think, and then people really relate to that. I think, man. Like, uh, that's crazy. You've done a lot of cool stuff, man. Like, uh, that's uh that's very. Uh, are you just one of those like go getters? You one of those guys that's like jogging at at six in the morning or something? Uh, I'll try. I have a gym in the house, so I don't have to <laughs> do anything. I've got a pool, yeah, and I, I live next to a canyon, so I I have very little time. I uh, I did write a movie. So one of the things I set out to do was write the book. I didn't think I'd write the book uh, on Lincoln Park. And um, that was no easy task. So I I believe if you're going to do something, do it right, finish it. You know, Um, I did write this movie that's I'm super, super excited about. I'm talking to a few different um, production companies about it. Uh, And I based that because I came up with an idea for a horror movie, told a whole bunch of people about it. And four years later, four different companies came out and did the same movie. And so a couple of years ago, I sat down and I was like, I really need to write something. And um, I'm super proud of it. And I, you know, have been able to revise it over and over and get, you know, give it to people. And they're like, the, for a horror thriller movie, uh, the character development is, you know, way above what it normally would be for something like that. And there's a story, it's a whodunit. So in my opinion, yeah, I'd love to set out and present new challenges to myself otherwise you don't really grow you know you become uh just kind of you know you float along and and i like being challenged so nice i mean i think it's a great outlook i mean that's that's what america's yeah. about man that's the american dream in, in a nutshell man like uh, you're able to do whatever you want in this world if you just work for it really and i love i love seeing that success man that's cool um, oh thank you man well i haven't the movie hasn't come out yet so if there's financiers out there i've got a great script hit me up jeff blue <laughs> what's that everybody that's in it's Chef Blue Music at Instagram, and that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Cool, man. That's awesome. Yeah, like uh, yeah, the you know, movies are fun too. I'm I'm adding like a TV show now. Those, those are that. I mean, that's that's a fun industry. Like, I couldn't do what you do. I think I think music's harder. I think like for, for my brain, music's harder for me than uh than like. And I've written songs that weren't good. I mean, I, I tried the whole music thing when I was a kid, but I, I'm, I just wasn't good at it. I realized I wasn't. T- I saw Mars Volta live, and I go, I'm not a musician. Like immediately, <laughs> like I saw uh, it was Mars Volta that did it to me when he threw like a microphone thirty feet in the air and caught it, and then had like people like waiting to give him hot water to drink. I'm like, I'm just not a musician. I mean, I just like right, saw right. I saw it very clearly there. So I respect guys like you that can like kind of like wear multiple hats in the industry, like like as like the businessman, as the artist, as like I really I really think that's cool, and I I, I love music. I'm a I probably have like the um. The skill set of like of like like anyone in music, I have the same kind of like taste in music, almost like that. It's multi genre. I love music. I'm obsessed with the stories. It's just like I'll probably read your book, even you know what I mean. But I'm just not like a, a person that could create it, you know. And I, and I always respect people that can. It's just not on my. Well, brain. you never know. And um, the way I got my start, you know, I wanted. I was an actor in at UCLA, and I was going to be a doctor. I, I realized I started at, in honors kinesiology because I started as a fitness instructor in high school, and realized that I don't like blood and people study way harder than me at, at UCLA. So got out of that, went into econ, learned about stocks and do stocks all the time. Everything you pick up along the way, you build your life and, and what your, your, you know, your experience goal, your experiences are and what you're good at. And, you know, I suck at basketball. I suck at basketball. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm pretty bad, you know, so I don't do it, you know, but I do stuff that I like to do. And, uh, in my career, 
uh, I wanted to, you know, I was a, a drummer and I was in a rock band and I just didn't fit that mold of the personality to be on tour in a van, you know? Um, so I was constantly getting kind of bounced. They're like, dude, you, you brought all these people out and you have this. I just realized I was a better business guy. I could write music, but I wasn't a guy, you know, that could not shower for three days and sit in a van. I just couldn't do it, you know? Oh, and, yeah. uh, touring is fun for like a 24 year old. I'm 35. I couldn't imagine touring right now. I, I couldn't even. Like, yeah. And to me, I was just, you know, uh, so long story short, I discovered what A&R was. And the minute I did, and I, I honor, ironically discovered it as a complete fluke, um, uh, with somebody who took a meeting with me thinking I was in a, a, a different band and it's all in this book that it's, it was just one of those moments, every moment in your life is important. Like even this conversation we're having right now, this could lead to something. Somebody could be watching this and it could lead to something For sure. uh, get inspired. But I took this meeting and this guy completely thought I was somebody else. Yeah. And, uh, I didn't leave that office. And he goes, Oh, you got to leave. I thought you were in a different rock band. And I was like, hell no, I'm not leaving. I want to know what the hell you do. And he goes, I do a and R and I didn't know what that was. So he goes, come to this class. He's guest lecturing at UCLA. I went to the class, you know, snuck into it back row. Cause I didn't pay for it. And I sat there and I go, this is what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And I don't care what it takes. And, um, you know, it was that moment I was in law school and everything I did from that moment on was designed to get me a, a job in A&R. And I was rejected every single step of the way um, to the point where I was almost going to get up, give up. Uh, and this one company at the very end of the alphabet, uh, Zamba Music Publishing, gave me a shot. Um, and uh, that was the last company. Literally, I went through the entire rock. There was a thing called the rock, yellow pages of rock. And it was A to Z. And that was the last freaking company. Uh, and I that's why guys like you're successful because you'll do that. You'll do that work. I mean, those uh, those those get in a lot of people's heads, man. Like uh, if, if, you could, oh, if, yeah. if you could if you could if you could hear a no and just kind of be like, all right, we'll have a good day and still stay positive and stuff. I mean, it's always guys like you that end up doing that, man. The, the perseverance, the ambition. I mean, you, you seem like a guy would be successful. Whatever you do, you just like doing this. Like that's I mean I feel like mm -hmm. you could probably like your personality I mean you, you seem like you get along with people you can network well you, you have the ambition you have the talent I mean you could probably do anything you wanted to I mean that's what within the like, confines of what we're talking I mean like just whatever job you wanted you seem like a guy would be able to do that and I think that's what America I mean that's what it is we're the all-star team man we're full we're full of guys like you in different fields you know like we're all in different like everyone's in different fields and stuff but it, whatever we're drawn to you know it's a collaboration uh, I like seeing people win man like it's I'm glad to oh absolutely buddy I appreciate the sentiments for sure and it is it is a lot of hard work and, you know, um, I bet. you know, I wake up every morning going, Hey, I need to achieve this need to achieve that. And, uh, you know, you can't really sit back and go, Oh, you know, I, I tried. Yeah. yeah. I'm not, I'm not, like not I couldn't imagine that. Yeah. No, I couldn't imagine being like that, but most people are, and they're waiting for something to happen, you know, or yeah. this will happen if I'm patient. No, you've got to make your shit happen. You know, you gotta, but you have to have the talent in that arena to make it happen. You know, you've got to, it's, it's, it's hard work. An opportunity it makes good luck, but at the same time, you have to have that talent that it takes to get through that door, or else it's you know. Yeah, otherwise, you'll be in comedy. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and I'm not a funny guy. <laughs> yeah, I I didn't did do comedy because I just wouldn't. I just wouldn't. I, the music wasn't for me, man. Like I, I love it though. I'm, I'm the biggest fanboy of music, probably. You know, like one of them. And I and I love I love guys like you out there winning. You already have like you wrote songs that kill too. I didn't even know that. That's I, I found that out. And it's just, that was my biggest. Uh, in my opinion, my biggest accomplishment uh, the, that I'm most rad, proud yeah. of is when, because I was always going up there on <clears throat> behalf of other people and, you know, um, and celebrating their, their wins. And I was just always like, God, I, you know, I, I write music. And when I set out to do it, um, yeah, I had a number one hit. And that was just so rewarding to go up on stage and accept an award for something that I had envisioned and seen through pretty much on all ends. And I used all my experiences through the years to get to that spot and god was at a uh, you know it wasn't it wasn't a lincoln park band and it wasn't you know huge it was we kind of had like a two-hit wonder um but uh it you know to this day when people go oh my god i love that song that was my high school graduation song or you know wow. uh that really wow. means a lot and it's yeah it's like 12 13 years old now and still people are like oh my god i love that you know so well, yeah, Paul McCartney's still torn off 60s stuff, man. Like, like I'm say. definitely no Paul McCartney. I, I, <laughs> no, I'm just I, saying, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the time doesn't matter, man. In realm ever with some, yeah. I mean, man, I'm just lucky to to have done what I love to do, and I'm looking for new artists. So, you know, as we were discussing, um, <clears throat> wherever you know your listeners are, 
I do a lecture with a university. So I'm looking for universities that I can do a, a full lecture with. And we cover music publishing, marketing, um, how to break into the industry, what it takes, what is a &R. You know, I, um, as a lawyer, you know, I graduated from UCLA or from Loyola Law School and went to UCLA undergrad. I've lectured at law schools like University of Michigan um, Law School, uh, I've CLE stuff in, you know, Louisiana, just for, um, you know, continuing education credits. Um, and I've lectured all over, you know, university as a lecturer all the time at U UCLA, USC, um, you name it, all over the country. And uh, I do a lecture and then I do a showcase with the artists, local artists, and um, it, they perform and there's, you know, there's a back, uh, a back line. And when the other band is breaking down, the other artists could be, you know, country pop, hip hop, whatever it is. Uh, I am doing a consultation <clears throat> with the artists that just performed and I discuss everything that they really need to work on, their strengths, their weaknesses, you know, their music, the songwriting, um, their socials, anything that it takes to break that artist and what it's going to take to have them rise above uh, the just the great artists and become phenomenal. And uh, that is uh, something where I give back to that community. And, you know, instead of having an artist have to, you know, get all this money to go to, you know, save up, buy a plane ticket, you know, get a, a rent a car, you know, food, all this kind of stuff, hotel, and go out to Los Angeles or New York in the hopes of actually um, getting a gig at a, a venue and the one in a million shot that an A&R person is going to be sitting there and the one in a one and a half million shot that they're going to actually pay attention uh, that I'm going to be in a room and watching them intently. And the other flip side is in the history of the world, I don't think any A&R person has walked into a room and seen an artist stay the entire time and gone, Hey, I'm going to give you a full uh, analysis of what you guys did wrong, what you did right. You know, they're, they're halfway into their drink and leaving, you know? So um, that is what I do. I enjoy doing that. And I love sitting down with an artist and really discussing what we can do to make them great, you know, and, and honesty, you know, and not just sugarcoating it. Like, Hey, you guys were great. Blah, blah, blah. You know, try this, blah, blah, blah. I get down dirty and, you know, any artist who wants to sit down with me, uh, you should expect the blunt truth. I think my whole room is turning pink. I'm going to turn on a light here, but <laughs> <laughs> no, you seem like a guy who doesn't have interest in bullshitting people. Like I kind of tell by your vibe, like you seem, you seem like an authentic dude. And like you, you almost get like bored. I, I can see when I, when I carry the conversation in certain ways, you almost get bored when it's not authentic. I can kind of, I can just kind of see it, with, it within you, man. It's, I, it's, I, I yeah. trust your instinct, honestly, like just, just out of like just the 10 seconds or the, the hour, I guess I've, I've, I've talked to you. Like I, I kind of see that. That's cool, man. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, I mean, that's what, that's what we're here. You know, everybody has a purpose in life and I believe that's, you know, that was mine. And I, I found that out pretty early on. I was always like, what is my purpose, you know, to be here on earth? And, um, it, you know, it kind of happened. And then I, it was confusing because I didn't know how I had this ability to communicate and discover things, but it is what I was a gift that I had. And then, you know, to me, it's, you know, I am not the artist, which is what I think we all would love to be, but I have the ability to communicate and, and facilitate that vision so other people could derive pleasure and meaning from it. And I mean, Lincoln Park and that Macy, whoever I've worked with along the ways, they've all touched humans across the world, you know, all worldwide artists that have made an impact in some way or another. I don't care if it's, you know, corn and setting, you know, just getting that anger out and doing that, but the, their music is therapy. You know, it's all a therapy. And so when you're listening to music, you're either being remembering something or you're forgetting something. But when you're listening to music, there is a, a brain function that you are, it's bringing you back to a time that you're, you're remembering in a positive, negative way, whatever, it's resolving some issues in your brain or it's making you forget about all the shit. And you're just like, just, you're, you know, on a different plane connecting with the music. So um, I consider it a very important job. No, I agree, man. That's you hit on a lot of good points, and I think I grew out of a lot of like corn and lump biscuit. I, I sure loved them at a the time, man. That, that was like, uh, I mean, a lot of these. Like, I I loved those bands you worked with. Uh, pretty much all the bands you worked with. I, I, I never really got big into Aaliyah, but I mean, a lot of people did. But the re the rest of your the rest of your stuff, man. I'm pretty much 
I, I had a mo- that was like a moment of my life each time, you know, like, and I think a lot of people can relate mm. to that. And I, and I think before we talk to nine more, like for like nine more hours, so this podcast is like crazy long, we should throw out some like, uh, throw, out, throw out some social media and stuff. You want people to follow you on? I mean, you already throw out your Instagram, but like maybe a little reminder for people like uh, that want to get Every, in touch with you or anything. Everything is Jeff Blue Music. So okay. Jeff Blue Music.com, um, my Insta, Twitter, all that kind of stuff. I, I'm, I'm mainly on Instagram. Uh, it's just, you know, Jeff blue music, even if you just type in J E F F B L U E, it'll come up. And, um, yeah, I, I try to answer everything, but, um, I do do consultations, so I can't listen to everybody's music. <clears throat> if people, uh, can you an- analyze this? Can you tell me what I do do one-on-one conversations where, um, through that I've signed a multitude of artists from, you know, to Island Def Jam, Atlantic, Universal Republic, Universal, uh, Interscope you name it artists where I'll, I'll sit down and somebody go, Hey, can you spend some time with me? And I do do that service and it could lead to me working with these artists and, you know, going in the studio, uh, producing some stuff, co-writing. And then I do bring those uh, certain artists that I really truly believe in uh, to record labels and have been able to get uh, deals for these artists, obviously, you know, fairly sizable deals um, just had a, n- a new artist that we worked with. Um, get the title track to uh, Mark Wahlberg new movie and a huge, huge payday for a sync. So I also do syncs, uh, you know, with uh, film and TV placements for music. And that's a huge way for artists to break and a huge source of income. Oh, that's right. I think, so, uh, um, I think artists need, need a guy like you. And is glad, I'm glad that they uh, can maybe find you on this podcast or just in general or something like that, like outside of this too. I mean, I think like that's a huge part that a lot of people don't have. You I mean like a skill set like they, they just don't have. Like people can write killer songs, right. but they have no idea what to do with them. Like I think personally. So that's good. If you're, yeah. if you're a, a musician or your kid's a musician or anybody like that, uh, don't be delusional don't have a budget, but at least, <laughs> but, then, but then look up to, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, look up to Jeff. And like, I mean, see if we can help you and stuff. And I appreciate your time and I wish you continued success. Absolutely, man. Man. Killing, man. Well, All I right. need to get a beard like that. Mine, mine just starts getting, yeah, kind of air. Well, uh, that's an uh, impressive, I'll, that's an impressive animal you have hanging over there. That's we'll give you a consultation thing. on it later. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great, man. Hey, it's a pleasure. And, Likewise. um, what was it called? What was the what was the company called again for the beard? I forget. Weather Beard Shout Supply. Out. Weather Beard Supply. Weather Beard Supply. Sponsors, All right, yeah. There you go. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Use best guys. show. Best show is your promo code. Like one word. Best show. Boom.